real estate is about freedom, choice freedom, time freedom, and money freedom, and the impact you can make with that freedom. But it doesn't come without cost. Your freedom takes work. That's why Neil Timmons brings together the tools you need to build your real estate legacy, from tips and tricks to interviews with industry titans. It's all here in one place. Real Grit. Let's get to it. Hey everybody, welcome to Real Grit. I'm Neil Timmons. Hey, I'm excited. We've got uh, we've got a big one in the house today. We got Mike Hambright. Mike Mike's a veteran real estate entrepreneur. He's real habbed and wholesaled at least 400 plus houses. Built a rental portfolio consistent of single family properties. He's got an ownership stake in over $100 million in multifamily investments. Uh, in addition to his extensive experience there, he's a founder of FlipNerd.com. He's produced 1,500 plus podcasts, millions of views and downloads. Mike's coached hundreds of real estate investors directly, thousands indirectly, and sought after as an advisor of many of America's top real estate investors through his Investor Fuel Real Estate Mastermind. It's a leading organization, over 150 of the nation's leading real estate investors. Additionally, Mike's co-founder of Investor Machine, the most cutting edge tech and data-driven lead generation system in the country for professional real estate investors. Uh, he's a husband to Lindsay, father of Jake. So I'm excited to have him here. Mike, how are you, my friend? I'm good. Good to see you, Neil. Good to see you. I appreciate you taking the time to connect here. I'm excited oh, of to, course. to catch up and hear about uh, all, the, all the new happenings you've got going on. <laughs> but hey, before, before we, yeah, no, that's, that's right. But before we talk about what's new, tell me, tell me this, where'd you even start in this business? How'd you even, what was the entry point to the industry? Uh, so 2008, uh, really kind of probably 2007 ish. I started to dabble with a couple of things, um, but really kind of started full-time in 2008. And, uh, I was, I kind of referred to myself as a corporate refugee. So we were, my wife and I were both in corporate America had, you know, um, kind of climbed our way up to middle management, if you will. So yeah. had decent paying jobs, all that stuff. But, um, you know, the short version is I got fired from a job that I loved because it was a kind of a political issue with my boss. And so my boss got fired and like, Hey, that guy's got to go to mm -hmm. whatever your name is you're going to yep. uh, type thing. And then went to work for a startup that was flying high and did really well for like 18 months until they filed for bankruptcy. And then I was kind of out on the streets again, if you will. Yeah. And for me, it was, you know, at the time I was still a relatively young guy and it was just this wake up call of like, Hey, I need to take my financial future and what I do for a living into my own hands, because, you know, I'm just tired of working really hard for somebody else and not having any control over where that ultimately goes. And so uh, that was, that was kind of the beginning. So started flipping houses in the Dallas area here and got off to the races pretty fast. In fact, our first year, we ended up, I think, doing about 65 uh, deals, mostly rehabs, a little bit of probably, you know, a third wholesale or two thirds, um, fix and flips. And so kind of doing it the hard way as we started out Sure. and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of stuff happened other than that, but I know you want the show to be more than five minutes. So I'll stop. <laughs> 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 well, let's, uh, I, I'll just go down a couple of rabbit holes. Tell me, you know, fix and flip, you did a ton year one. What had you even go down that path versus wholesaling or, or doing something else? So in 2008, you know, a lot of investors were running away from the industry and yeah. we were running in, but we were, honestly, we were naive. We didn't know what we were running into, but we were just like running towards wanting a better life for ourselves and more yeah. control and like towards success. Like we're going to make this successful no matter what. So we didn't have like a lot of investors, you don't have insurance. Like what do you, you know, how are you doing all these things? Why don't yeah. you go get a real job? And for us, we were just committed to making it happen. So a couple of, of good things, some blessings happened as we had, we got access to some capital through friends and family uh, that would lend to us. And at the time where a lot of banks stopped lending, mm -hmm. we had a friend of a friend that knew the president of a small local bank. And they kind of made a bet on us after we had done a few deals and kind of showed them, you know, they're like, how do you buy these things so cheap? They were kind of a real estate based bank, but mostly for builders, not for fix and flip guys. But they're like, yeah, we'll give you a shot. So we kind of had a line of credit with them. So we had some capital, which was fortunate. We probably would have wholesaled more if it, if it weren't for that. And so, you know, interestingly enough, I really knew almost nothing about wholesaling when I started. Like I just knew of fit, buying houses, fixing them up and flip. I didn't even know sure. that, but I knew of it just from right. TV shows and stuff like that. Like I, I really loved, I kind of fall in love with the idea of the transformation. Right. And so, uh, tended to lean more towards that, um, in the beginning. And, and then truthfully, uh, over time we realized, Hey, we make a lot more money doing this anyway. So I mean, I've definitely wholesaled and assigned, you know, 
a lot of deals, but um, our tendency was always to kind of retail them, like retail them out, or, you know, I guess starting maybe eight or nine years ago, uh, maybe 10 years ago, even um, I, I had a, a good friend, a guy with a lot of experience that basically referred to me before. And I never really thought about this. And I don't want to s- say this. Like I know somebody that said, well, I invented wholesaling. I'm like, that's a bold statement, you know, right. uh, but I was probably one of the first guys. And I knew a couple of people that were doing it before me in a roundabout way yeah. that we kind of refer to as wholesaling now. Yep. So it's just, it, it, it's a long story as to kind of how that path, how I went down that path, but I was doing that, you know, way before it was cool. I'll say that. <laughs> you, you, you had to have made it cool. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. The, the run up in the market. <laughs> it made my and, life easier. It made yeah. my life easier. Yeah. And it, and, and wholetailing has certainly gotten easier given uh, the tightness and supply, right. And, yep. and, and the velocity of demand. Now you can just get away by doing less. Right. Yeah. You know, when I go back to 2009, 10 Mm -hmm. in the Dallas market, so Texas Mm -hmm. was never really hit as bad as a lot of markets. The market was down, but there's been an influx of population coming here for a long time. Right. And even back in 2009 and 10, when a lot of people were either licking their wounds or out of business, like it would be uncommon for us to list a new retail house, like fully rehab, put on the market for it to not be under contract within a week. That's incredible. We weren't getting like 40 or 50 showings, like what happens now. Right. Uh, But we just built a better mousetrap. Like we would put out the nicest product and price it like right at or just below market. And we just basically inserted ourselves to be next in line. Yep. And so um, I think that's kind of the game. It's not, you know, it's not to like, how do I, there's some guys that I know that like, they are trying to set the set. bar yep. in a market. They're trying to over rehab and that's worked in some markets, especially right. like where I'm at in DFW right. now, but those are going to be the first folks that get hurt in any sort of downturn for sure. Yeah, if you're going to play that game, you need to be quick to adjust pricing. And yeah. you may take a short on one or two if, if yeah. the market turns hard enough, right? No doubt. Yeah. How'd you go about even finding a contract? Not any piece of the business is, is easy, but that's that can be a really challenging. Yeah, issue. it's interesting because there's always, there's parts of my life that I look at and I say, I got lucky here. And you, mm-hmm. know, I, you know, what I think about luck is like, you kind of make your own luck. Like that's I figured right. out a way to be in the right place at the right time. Or, so I, I did get lucky in a roundabout way. I found a, a, through a referral from somebody else that I knew that um, had done a bunch of deals. They referred me so a, to a contractor that they hadn't used much, but they knew of. And um, it ended up being a partnership with two guys. And so I kind of never knew the second guy until the first guy decided to move out of state. Mm-hmm. So then the second guy uh, came in, his name's Kevin. You might've met Kevin. He's in nice Kevin yes. Burke. Yeah. And uh, we've become, at this point, you know, fast forward, gosh, 14 years now, he's one of my best friends. Like, you know, we, we go to hockey games, we, we, we like travel together, our families get together, we do all kinds of things. He's like, you know, I care a lot about him. We're good friends. Yeah. Um, and we've had lots of ups and downs along the way, no doubt about it. We've sure. broken up and we've gotten back together and all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah. But it was just this relationship kind of built on trust. Like I said, for the first several years, there were lots of ups and downs, but I think it came to a place of mutual respect mm. to where I can trust him with any part of my life right now. Like I would trust him with anything. Yep. And, you know, some of it is one of the things that I've told, like over the years, I've done a lot of coaching and stuff. And yep. one of the challenges with finding a contractor is you have to find a way to where they're important to you and you're important to them. Yep. And so if you don't do a lot of volume, if you rehab a house every like, you know, four times a year or something like that, you're not that important to them because they have lots of other clients and they're spending a bunch of time trying to find business. But when you get to a point to where, you know, back in the heyday, when I was doing a lot more volume, we were probably rehabbing seven to 10 houses at any time. And Kevin was handling all of them. Right. And so he didn't work for anybody else. Like he had crews built around kind of my business. And then as I started to kind of slow down because I had other businesses and a rental business and coaching and lots of other things that got bolted on over time. One way I maintained that relationship with him was I would introduce him to people that I thought he should work with to the point today where almost everybody he works with at this point is probably somebody that I introduced, but that's another way to do it. If you're not doing a ton of volume, it's like almost create a little bit of a co-op of some people that you know, that need a reliable contractor too, and kind of go at it from the angle of like, Hey, we're together on this. So if you screwed one of us, you screwed all of us. That's exactly right. And together we're kind of important to you or we should be, yeah. you know? Yeah. So let's call that a, you know, a decade plus of flipping homes, you know, 14 years or so. Um, what's been the biggest challenge in, in that business specifically flipping? Yeah. Biggest challenge. Um, it, it is finding contractors and finding the right people, whether it's acquisitions, people, whether it's people in your office. I mean, 
I've been through a bunch. Obviously, you're you're the king at uh, helping folks find the right team members. But that that has always been the problem is finding the right people to be in your business that are you know productive and going to be yeah. happy and uh, you can rely on them. And because this is a, for a lot of folks, this is a hard business to step out of, if you will, right? So correct finding the right team is clearly the biggest challenge, probably in all businesses, but certainly in the in the rehabbing space or the yeah. uh, investing space. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's talk about stepping out of the business. Let's just pivot to uh, rental properties, single family homes. So you, you've built a portfolio over a period of time. Yep. Uh, and so knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently, if anything, relative to the item, the, the homes that you fixed and flipped or wholesaled along the way? Yeah. I mean, in terms of rentals specifically. Yeah. I mean, would you have kept more? Would you have not? Oh, for it, sure. Yeah. That's uh, the biggest, like hindsight's always 2020. Like now, you know, we have rentals that we paid like 15 grand for and put 15 or 20 into them that are worth like 200 now. Like we flipped hundreds of houses. Like, why didn't we keep more of them? And at the time, you know, who would have known, right? right. That, Correct. Like, even in Texas, I had kind of a mentor in a roundabout way of somebody that owned a lot of doors. I think at the time, uh, I think he's sold some stuff off now, uh, but he owned about 2000 doors in the Dallas market wow. and uh, probably one of the bigger guys in town, but the type of like millionaire next door guy, like yeah. not very many people even know who this guy is because yeah. he just does, has, doesn't put himself out there, you know? And he's like, you got to focus on cash flow. You're never going to get any appreciation in Texas, maybe two or 3% a year. And of course that's like changed dramatically now, but that, that is how it was for a long, long time. Yeah. And now, you know, all bets are off because the world's upside down. Yeah. Right. It yep. looks completely different. Yeah. Yeah. And about- we're doing stuff now we're doing, um, you know, we used to just try to like bang them out. Like, you know, we would kind of low budget, like if we, if we measured a rental rehab, mm-hmm through many of the years, we would always budget it at a lower level than a retail rehab because it doesn't need to be quite as nice because it's just going to be a rental. But I'll tell you now, we're actually going back and doing much nicer rehabs. And sometimes we're just putting more cost into the materials. Like I'm putting in these composite floors now that are like three times the cost of carpet, but they have a 50 year life. You can't burn them. They can get wet and you can just take them apart and dry them. And so you know, just thinking about the maintenance cost of rentals, because if you just go for like the cheapest carpet, I mean, you're going to replace that between every tenant, you know? Right. So it's not so much about making it look exactly like what a flip product would look like, but it's really about hardening the asset so that right. it, it can take more wear and tear from, for sure. from, from somebody who's going to live there. It's not going to treat, playing it, the long not game, gonna treat I mean, it like us. Yeah. If you're playing the long game, that's, that's what you should do. Right. Right. Yeah. From a cash flow standpoint, you're exactly yeah. right. Talk to me about coaching and then into invest your fuel for folks who, uh, yeah. who aren't as familiar with it as I am. Sure, sure. So when I started, um, I guess a couple of years into my business, I like to say that I, my wife and I were working really hard. We were in this like tiny hole in the wall office in uh, a northern suburb of Dallas. And we were just kind of, we just got to a point to where like, you know, I've always, you know, me as the guy that hosts a mastermind now and all these things, right? I'm kind of a party planner, <laughs> if you will. And I've always been that guy. I've been that guy since high school. Yeah. And even when we were in corporate America, like, you know, it's always somebody's birthday. There's always a happy hour. If you work for companies that have hundreds or thousands of people, like right. there's always something. Always something. Yep. And then it went to my wife and I, and like, you know, an older lady who was our admin in a hole in the wall office without any exposure to anybody other than just like working with those three people yeah. for the most part. And it got to a point where we just got kind of lonely. So the first thing I did is I actually sponsored and I didn't even know why I was, I didn't really have any way to make money. I started to sponsor a table, like a RIA club. So I was like, Hey, I need to like meet people and, you know, maybe I can sell them some deals. Maybe they'll sell me some deals. And that evolved into uh, me having conversations with people about like, how do you do this? Like, can you show me how to do it? Um, And then I started doing some, uh, something I call rehab live. I used to basically take people to our rehabs and I would basically invite you know, back then there weren't, there weren't even, I'm going to, I got to be careful dating myself here. You know, how it's like, there weren't even meetup groups back then, <laughs> but there weren't, there were like list serve sites, you know, like yeah. somebody will give you a doubt, they'll give you basically an email that you can send to that's a distribution list, like into their RIA club. So as a sponsor, I got access to the list of people that were in that club and it was a pretty good size club. Yeah. So I started to invite people like, Hey, I'm going to do this thing called rehab live, come out and watch us rehab a house and basically come three times, like right at the beginning and yeah. all its glory before we've even trashed it out, come again in the middle where you you can kind of see where we're going here and then come again a couple of weeks later at the end. And you're going to see this massive transformation, you know, people really love that. And we would just sit around and talk about it. And that led into kind of coaching. Like people are like, who are your contractors? Can you show me how to do this? People want to lend you money. Like 
when you kind of entertain or educate and educate people, and educate. like there's some level of reciprocity, like they trust. Some of them start to know, like, and trust you. Maybe some of them don't. And that turned into opportunities to coach and get deals from people. And so that turned into a pretty large coaching operation ultimately. And I kind of partnered with a lot of people like we JV on deals and, or they would <laughs> assign deals to me. I was the first person they would go to because they knew I could close. And back then I could, you know, I would basically, the way I kind of separated myself was like, I'll close if the title's clear, like I close in 48 hours, you know, or I was the guy that if a deal fell through and you got to close on this thing in a hurry, like come yep. to me. Right. So I was kind of that guy and I got a lot of joy out of teaching and educating people and all that. So I've done a lot of coaching and I got to the point to where I realized um, I would had some kind of students that became successful yep. and they became more of peers. Like we could talk about real problems in the business and stuff like that. Right then I realized that, man, I really like talking with people that I kind of see as a peer more so than a new person. Right. And in hindsight, like now I look and I say, look, it's way easy for me to talk to people and advise them and give guidance or whatever on taking somebody from 20 to 40 or 40 to 60 deals than to get somebody from zero to one. Correct. Because that zero to one group, and I was there too, we were all there at all some point. And yep. I have a soft spot in my heart for, for newbies, but it's not even about real estate investing. It's about nope. what's between their ears. That's it's exactly the mindset right. of all that. Does this really work? Should I quit my job? Like all these like, you know, mindset things. Right. And so that, that really was kind of the beginning of Investor Fuel, the mastermind. And so that's been about four and a half years now that we've been doing that. And it's grown into something, you know, bigger than I ever could have imagined. And I feel like we're still just getting started too. Talk to me a little about the, the format of Investor Fuel and, and really, you know, the types of people who plug in, who, who this might be good for. Yeah. Yeah, we have. Um, so we've kind of broadened out to where we actually have multifamily investors uh, as well. Now I'll come back to that. But for the most part, it's single family investors. Um, and we have a couple of groups. There's a group for people doing 10 to 50 deals a year. We call that the gold group. And then our platinum group is those doing 50 deals and above. And we've got some folks in our group that are doing five or 600 deals a year now. We have some heavy hitters in there. But I think, in fact, I have a call today with somebody that was in the group, somebody you would probably know that actually left the group. You know, it's been six months and they're like, I miss this group. I got to come back. And we yeah. that's happened a few times. Maybe, maybe it'll happen to somebody else we know, Neil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's like, I'll call it an association. It's a yeah. professional association of bringing people together in a place where they can share what's working and what's not, and not be afraid to admit that stuff isn't working, right? And so I think it's kind of a safe place to come, just kind of get your problems out there and yeah. ask for feedback from people that you respect and and uh, would do the same for. So it's, I'll say it's, in many ways, it's a brotherhood with plenty of women in the group as well, yep. but uh, we're just a tight knit family of people that wanna help each other get to the next level. Well, you know, the challenging part uh, about this business is, and depending where you're at, right, and, and certainly my neck of the woods, it's a small business. There's not that many people who do this. And for right. for one to be able to have real conversations uh, with folks who experience what you experience, what you're going through, trends, what's taking place in the industry, what's coming down the pipeline, the ability to plug into a, a brotherhood, a group of people who are not your competitor in your backyard, but who are going through the exact same two things you're going through and you want the best for them and they want the best for you. And neither one, you know, it's only a plus plus nobody, neither one loses, no matter what yeah, you share with somebody else. Sure. It's a terrific spot. And you've been able to foster that environment for, for hundreds of people. Yeah. And it's a ton of fun. And you're right though. Like I kind of use this example of, uh, we have some friends in our neighborhood that we got to dinner with sometimes, mm -hmm. or uh, like one of my best friends that was my roommate in college. Like I can't go out to dinner and say, Hey man, I made 60 grand on a house yesterday. And I can't say I lost 30 grand on a house yesterday. Those are like alien conversations. They're like, you made $60,000 yesterday? Or like, how did you even have $25,000 to lose? Like, right. or even stuff like, so you find yourself as an investor kind of on an island, right? You can't really talk about the stuff that you want to talk about because the people that are around you, that they're not in that business, it's so alien to them that it's going to sound like you're bragging, right? Right. And it's like, I don't, I'm not saying this to brag. Like, I'm just saying what happened. I mean, we know there's ups and downs. And so, Correct. so it's hard to get around people that uh, kind of get you right. I mean, we're all a little bit weird. We've worked yeah. really hard to get here and uh, finding yeah. that group of people that you can op open up to is worth its weight in gold when you find the right group. Well, we're all, we're all pretty much unemployable. And the, 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 way, <laughs> yeah. the way things work is you just need to hang out with other people who are unemployable and That's magic, right. magic happens really. 
Yeah. 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 I was with somebody a while back and it, it, this is when it really hit home. This is actually probably a few years ago with somebody in our neighborhood. And, and they said, what do you have going on? You know, what are you going on next week? And I was like, well, we were going on a vacation and we had just gotten back from a vacation. Now, the truth is, is when I'm on vacation, I'm usually working too. And we're finding a way to fit it all in as entrepreneurs and just this look on their face. And they kind of like, didn't you just get back from vacation? And I, and I was just like, okay, I'm just going to zip my lip. And like, I, I can't really, I'm not, I didn't say it to brag. It was just like, matter of fact, like this is, you know, it wasn't always this way, no. uh, but I worked hard to get here. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about that. It wasn't always this way. Knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently as an investor looking back? I mean, clearly kept more houses like we talked yeah. about. I feel like uh, early on, you know, I had one of the benefits of us coming out of corporate America is we really understood investing in the business, right? With building out systems and processes mm. and scaling up our advertising. And we really kind of probably had a leg up on somebody if you haven't been through, you know, that type of environment before. But I feel like uh, back to the people part, like I feel like we really struggled with that. Like we, um, I would have hired people a lot more, a lot sooner. I would have hired a true coach. I would have back then there really weren't masterminds. It was more like RIA clubs were like kind of the place to be, but I would have found a way to surround myself or with people like kind of what I do now. Like I'm, yep. some ways I've created what I wish I had when I was earlier in my career. Right. And so just sure. getting around the right people. And I also feel like because I had gotten fired from like a dream job in corporate America, and now it's like, obviously you know, I ain't never going back. Right. But Not at the, the time anymore. it hurts. Right. And both jobs I had, you know, it was this uh, corporate feeling of like dog eat dog. Like you're always angling to get a promotion or try right. to like, Oh, this guy just left. Maybe I can get his job or that's just this. That's how the corporate environment is at the end right. of the day or in my experiences. And some of these are like multi-billion dollar companies are huge companies. Right. And so I feel like there wasn't this uh, culture of sharing and giving because you feel like somebody's going to take something from you. Right. And that came with me into the real estate space, probably 18 months, 24 months, where I just didn't want to share what I knew, or I didn't want to share my resources. And then that all kind of changed when I started doing these like rehab live things that I mentioned as I started people would ask questions and I was like, eh, I'm not going to tell you who that guy is. And um, you know, I kind of would like say, well, I can't tell you who my roofer is or whatever. And then it gave to the point to where I was like, you know, I'll tell you who all my contractors are, except for my general contractor. Like that's like a good babysitter. I'm not going to tell you. Who yeah, you correct. Are, yeah, that's Cause exactly I want right. to be available when I'm available. But I think once I started to share and once I started to do deals with people and I kind of saw this, like, wow, the more I give, the more I get mentality, yeah. everything changed for me. And, and I wish that it happened to me. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of folks out there who are, um, in this business, they're really good at getting, talking to people. They're really good at sales. You know, some of the best obviously come, come from the sales standpoint, especially if they're in the wholesale side, because the fix and flip, they just don't deal with it at all. But finding that next deal is a challenging piece for them. You've been able to help fill that gap with Investor Machine. Tell me a little about that. How did that come to fruition? And what do you guys do to help folks who- Oh, Investor you know, Machine, yeah. Yeah. So Investor Machine is really, we, I can kind of call it a lead gen agency, but we yeah. really become a, a data company. Uh, but our end product is kind of done for you lead generation for professional mm -hmm. investors. And so that actually happened. I actually just got off a call with uh, my partner, Jason Lewis, who, you yeah, know, I do. Jason and I, Jason, well, the way we met is he joined Investor Fuel and we were in his market in Salt Lake City for an event um, yeah. a couple of years back. At the first event, we just hit it off. I kind of say it was like peanut butter and jelly coming together. Like, I, cause I had done a bunch of stuff in the coaching space and I knew I'd always thought about kind of creating a done for you. Uh, marketing platform, but I just didn't want to run an agency. And I know that most people complain about the leads and they said the leads suck. And it's like, well, that's how the business works. Most of the leads suck. And every once in a while, there's one that doesn't, you know, and no, um, no so matter who, no matter who's running the lead. Right. Right. right? Yeah. So, so I just never took that on. And I was on the verge of doing it with some of my coaching programs of providing like a done for you service. And I just didn't pull the trigger on it. And then I met Jason and Jason was actually doing Legion for like two people at the time. So it was, this was small at the time. Yeah. And we just, just kind of started sharing our ideas and we just kind of clicked. Right. Yeah. And so that started uh, up with us plugging in people that I knew. It was some people from Investor Fuel at the time. It was, we actually just beta tested it in Dallas. Uh, this is beginning of 20, our summer of 2019. This was uh, August of 2019. Mm -hmm. And just because of a lot of relationships I had, we had like instant customers and people that just trusted us, but right. we had, you know, it was a delicate line because we're trying to get you to do something new here, but 
you know, we haven't quite figured this out ourselves yet. Right. Uh, and we still have some of our very first customers. It was really cool. We were just talking about uh, that from the very beginning. Um, despite a bunch of challenges that we had in hindsight, but now we, we run way more efficiently now. Sure. So effectively, you know, in terms of building a better mousetrap, we just know that he with the or she with the best data wins. Yep. And we've just found a way uh, through an army of people, like almost 100 people that work for us now that wow. just are data, data miners. They literally are just going into the markets where we operate in, which is about uh, counties, I'll say, about 350 counties around the country mm -hmm. right now. And we're going into those counties every day and every week and mining new data that we effectively built some software to do kind of list stacking on steroids. Uh, so we try to find the most distressed stuff in a market, and then we kind of white glove handle managing their direct mail campaigns and skip tracing uh, if they want to do that, and probably some other things in the future as well. So um, because of the mastermind and because the Jason's a rock star yeah. and all the stuff that we've done, the stars were kind of aligned for people just to trust in us, which we don't take lightly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so now we're running the marketing. We're effectively out, an outsourced marketing manager for a lot of the top investors in the country at yeah. this point right now. So it's, it's turned into something that we never would have expected. And it's really cool. At this point, we feel like we're just getting started actually. Yeah. Who's that ideally for the type of investor size wise, so single family at, investors. Right? It's really for people that are spending at least enough to do a deal a month. Although we have people that are, you know, spending well into the six figures a month with us at this point. So kind of the professional investor that sees the value in, yeah, I could go mine this data. I could stack the list. I could order my mail every month, but why would I, if I could pay you guys effectively a fraction of what it would cost me to hire a marketing manager to do that for me. And you guys do it all day, every day. So you're proficient at it anyway. Right. Um, yeah. So people that, you know, understand the value. A lot of us as real estate investors are cheap. Like we try to do everything cheap, Correct. Right? I try to buy a house cheap. I want to try to get a cheap contractor. I want investor friendly pricing. Can I go spend my time at Home Depot finding you know, a fraction of a pallet of tile that's left and get a deal savings there without considering their opportunity costs of their time. And so we really work with the investor that understands the value of their time and the value of um, having marketing that's just a little bit better. I mean, operates a little bit better than everything else because yeah. that little bit is worth a lot to guys like us. That's where I think for somebody who's got a business and they know how to execute, the opportunity costs of are so high. Their ability to, to not stay in their lane, especially in today's market, you know, margins continue to increase is what it's been for the last, you know, one to two years or so. Right. They've got to stay focused and doing what they do best and outsource the rest. That's right. Yeah. Most, most of the better investors, there's something that they're, that everybody's very good at. And there's a bunch of other stuff that they're mediocre at. And right. a couple of things they're probably terrible at. Right. Correct. So a lot of folks in our business are really good at sales. Yep. Uh, not very many are really good at marketing. Some of them are really good leaders like you and can really build a team out. Yeah. And so, you know, you just have to find, I think it's hard because when we started, a lot of us were like a one man band, a one woman band, Correct. Or a husband and wife team, or right. like we were lean and mean, right? Yep. So we had to get scrappy. And sometimes it's hard to shed that history of like, we'll just do it ourselves. Um, because at the end of the day, that's a job. That's not a business. Correct. Well, then you being, you know, you meaning individually being scrappy and then hiring an employee and now expecting them to somehow be scrappy with your money. Right. That is a, I mean, <laughs> your, your expectations are askew. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. All right. So I want to bring it back and then to, to one thing and then we'll kind of move forward, but the, you mentioned um, in investor fuel, the multifamily piece, touch on that just a little. Oh yeah. So uh, about three years ago, I really made a shift to, uh, for my own investments to invest in multifamily. And what I kind of found was I love fixing and flipping. I love, I love the transformation, but it's very much a transactional business. Right. And it got me to where I was. And what I really wanted was to keep rentals. And so I kind of think of like today money, like active money, right. And then kind of more passive money. Right. And I just, because I had some other businesses, I wasn't super worried about today money anymore. Yeah. I was more worried about how do I invest, keep that invested. So I started to do some multifamily deals. Um, we've actually done some large self-storage development stuff as well, but most of it has been multifamily deals and where your money's working 365 days a year while you're sleeping. Uh, some of these properties that I'm invested in, I haven't even physically been to myself and they're like 25, $30 million properties, right? Yeah. So uh, trusted largely back to the whole coaching and relying on 
you know, paying for knowledge from somebody that can help you climb the learning curve a lot faster. For me, that was my good friend, Corey Peterson, you know, yeah. Corey, the big kahuna. Absolutely. And, um, and Corey used to be a single family guy and had moved into multifamily and owns a lot of doors now and uh, helps a lot of people um, achieve financial freedom and kind of invest passively. So I started investing with Corey and now it's to the point to where I'm a GP and the deals that he finds. And we had been friends for a long time and, and he was actually been an investor fuel, even though at the time it was all single family. Right. He's like, I don't even do single family anymore, but I'm here because I, I like the community. I like the friend. You know, I have some good friends here. And uh, finally I twisted his arm and said, let's start a multifamily group. And that's what we did. So that's only been up and running for, um, you know, maybe nine months or so now. And so we're at the very beginning, but about to see some uh, pretty amazing growth. So we've got people in there now that are, are fairly new that like, we've got a woman in the group that's fairly new. She's doing her first deal right now. It's a $40 million deal. Wow. And uh, first deal, cool, first deal. So I'm like single family, like yeah. zero to one, you don't really have a lot of knowledge like yet, Correct. you know, right. multifamily, it's like life changing, right? Correct. I mean, that changes your family tree for sure. Yes, but the is. cool thing is, is uh, in the cash flow, we call it our cash flow group. The, the multifamily group is the whole, all the members are involved. Like everybody gets a, anybody gets a deal. Like they're all helping each other raise money. They're all introducing them to all their kind of contractors and resources because many of those are national in scope instead of local, like they would right. be for single family guys. So it's really cool to see like what's happening over there and how everybody's working uh, together. And we feel like we're going to grow that group, you know, quite a bit over time here. And it's really cool because it allows me to participate in deals with people that are in right. the group. And, you know, that's not something I can really do in, for the most part in the single family groups. Well, I, th I think you said it that the multifamily really is a team sport. There yeah. are a lot of positions that have to be played to get a right. deal to close and to have that resource and the, the resources of, of multiple people and all their contacts. It, yeah, I can see that going a long way. So bring me to current. What's uh, what's this year look like for you, and where where are you headed? Yeah, I'm mainly focused on investor fuel. I'll say this: investor fuel is it is a business for me as a mastermind, but it's really my passion where my passion's at. With you just have a, a lot of amazing friendships, and and you know we we have quarterly events, but we also have. In fact, next week we're going to Vegas with about twenty so okay. members and shooting guns in the desert and something with champagnes and speed boats, which are probably two things that shouldn't go together, but uh, we're going to be in Vegas. So whatever <laughs> right. happens has to stay yep, there. That's right. So anyway, we, you know, we, we really kind of celebrate life together. A lot of us, we do uh, three different trips a year. So we've got a Vegas trip, a rafting trip to Colorado, and then uh, we have a trip to Cabo in the fall that about 30 or so people went last year. I think it'll be bigger this year. Yeah. So for me, it's just, you know, continuing to um, kind of pour into the group as much as I can. And I get a lot of value out of the friendships and uh, the relationships and just focusing on investor machine and trying to do more multifamily deals. And so uh, it, it's a lot of stuff. It adds up, yep. but that's, that's kind of my pure focus right now is just on impacting other people, which I get a lot of joy from yeah. um, and trying to build my family's legacy through multifamily investments. Through multi. Yeah, that's great. Well, let's move on to our final segment, what I call four for impact. What is your favorite quote? Favorite quote. Um, I knew you were going to ask that. So I had, I actually have it on a canvas uh, sign on my wall yeah. right outside of here. So uh, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Is to create which is a quote by Abraham Lincoln. Why is that so impactful for you? I, I just feel like there's opportunity out there for everyone. I mean, I talk a lot about, uh, I feel like there's a, you know, very much a victim mentality in America yeah. these days, or it's way too prevalent, let's say. Yeah. And um, if people really just focus on trying to change their lives or think bigger, like they can, the opportunity, the sky is the limit. Um, and so it kind of hits home because when I see people are not where they want to be in life or they're kind of woe is me, I'm like, you, you created that reality. Like there was yeah. a way to dig out almost no matter what your circumstance was. Right. Yep. What do you think holds uh, most investors back from hitting their personal next level? So I think it's uh, back to the um, not being willing to invest in the business, maybe not being willing to invest in their team. It could be in more marketing. I mean, I know a lot of, you know, pretty accomplished real estate investors. And sometimes the answer is as simple as like, you need to hire a COO or an operations person, or you need to double your advertising. Like it's working so well, why wouldn't you raise that up? And so you do sometimes more? it's simple answers, but it's really uh, kind of back to just investing in themselves and in their, into their business. Yeah. Outside of real estate, what are you most passionate about? Uh, I love to travel. Like yeah. we do quite a bit of travel. I have a son that's in high school now. So sometimes it's hard to get him to 
go with us. He's like, sure. drag his feet, but we've traveled, uh, done a lot of amazing things really in the time that I've been a real estate investor. Um, so love to travel. Yeah. What's your favorite way to make an impact in the community? You know, for me, it's uh, doing things like this, like being on podcasts. Uh, as you know, I've done a ton of my own podcasting yes. over the years. We're actually about to do something pretty incredible in the kind of podcasting uh, space by Flip Nerd becoming, uh, I'll just go ahead and put it out there. I don't know if I've actually said this publicly oh. before, but becoming more of a podcast network where we have several different hosts and shows on the oh, great. Flip, Nerd, Flip, yeah. Flip Nerd network, if you will. And so I think just kind of sharing our knowledge, sharing our experiences and um, doing that, you know, largely through social media and podcasts to just try to hopefully one way or another kind of be a beacon of hope, if you will, for yeah. others out there that are yeah. thinking about jumping in. Yeah, no, well, that's tremendous. I know you, you have made a deep impact in this community, so I'm appreciative of it. If you, for, for people who want to find you, follow you, connect, um, learn more about uh, everything we've talked about, Investor Fuel or, or uh, Investor Machine, what, what should they do? Where should they sure. go? Sure. Yeah. The best thing is uh, you can find me on, on Facebook. Uh, I'm maxed out on friends. So just hit the follow button and you'll kind of follow along with whatever I post out there. Um, in terms of Investor Fuel, you can go to investorfuel.com and learn more about us. And there's an opportunity to schedule a call and talk with our team if you're interested in that. And for Investor Machine, it's actually the Investor Machine. Dot com. We have a 15 minute uh, kind of overview of our process. Uh, I need to update that video. It's a little bit dated and we've moved, we've done some, we do some things even better now than we did in the past, but it'll give people a, a quick overview of our model and how it works. And we're, we're not pushy salespeople. We, you know, I am sales oriented. I have a sales team of people on my, on my team, but uh, we're happy to just answer questions and talk to folks and see if any of these things are a fit. And if not, then that's totally cool too. Yeah. We'll make sure we get uh, all the links in the show notes here. Thanks. Well, hey, for the audience's sake, I, I can't go this whole conversation without mentioning to them that you and I, I, I hail from Des Moines, Iowa, born and raised, still here. Yeah. And you are were born in Iowa. And you Illinois, still have, the uh, Illinois side. Oh, you were but born right just right, right, just right just over, over the, river. the river. You could see it. You could see yeah, it. Yeah, you could see it. You could smell it. You can smell it. <laughs> I don't know so which side you're smelling, but <laughs> well, they're, they're running hogs today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, cool. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. It's it's always uh, and and I know you got family back this way, so it's it's yeah. kind of funny just just from down the road. I was actually thinking about you. I went up to visit. I drove up actually to visit my family. Yeah. My mom's got some health issues, and anyway, drove up there a few weeks back and came through Des Moines. Yeah. I was, you know, that was part of a long on the tail end of a long drive. So yeah, I understand how uh, that goes. But yeah. whenever I go through Des Moines, which is not that often, I'm like, maybe I'll see Neil while yeah. I'm ripping through here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to connect. Very valuable. It's fun to hear your story all the way through and, and the impact you're making in this community. And people should absolutely follow you and connect up when they get a chance. I appreciate that. Thanks for the opportunity to share my story. You bet. For everybody here at Real Grit, I'm Neil Timmons reminding you that real estate requires real grit. I'll see you next time. If you like our content and want more, you can access it at realgritpodcast.com. You hear it guest after guest. Instinctively, you already know it. But let me call it out. The most expensive action is inaction. The real estate market is full of opportunities. You just need to uncover them. You can build a business that lasts for years, makes monumental impact in the lives of those that you love. It's not just about business, but about the freedom you get because of it. Have you ever heard the saying, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. I believe that partnering is essential. In fact, I partner with hardworking investors all the time. The point is that you can get a lot further with the right partner. Let me say it again, the right partner. If you've ever thought about partnering with anyone or if you have a partner now, I encourage you to download my free partner and profit guide, which includes the top five must answer questions to evaluate a profitable partnership. You can find it at www.legacyimpactpartners.com. I'll see you in the next episode.